Good afternoon, my name is Bob Brown. I'm the chair-elect of the Las Vegas Metro Chamber of Commerce. I'm also the president of Opportunity Village. I'd like to welcome you today to our power luncheon with Senator Dean Heller. You can all applaud. You know, the legislative decisions that are made in Washington, D.C. affect businesses in Las Vegas, and the Metro Chamber likes to bring these events so you can hear directly from the leaders what's going on back there. This is really important work for us, and we feel like the community deserves it. Now, one of the ways the Chamber is able to offer some of these dynamic programs that we have is that, guess what? We have sponsors. And so we want to thank our sponsors. Today's sponsors are Chamber Insurance and Benefits, Yes. Sunrise Health System. And the Las Vegas Review Journal. We thank them all for their commitment to the Metro Chamber in providing this event for us. And let's get a round of applause for Richard Del Paso of Aardvark Media for videotaping today. Richard, thank you. And the wonderful folks at Las Vegas Photo and Video for providing the photography today. A couple of uh, things to keep on mind for your calendar. Um, before we continue, I'd like to encourage all of you to attend the governor's Small Business Conference, that is Friday, September 19th at the Rio Convention Center. The conference will feature an expanded business resource expo, and it concludes with a plated luncheon featuring a keynote address from Governor Brian Sandoval. Also, don't miss our Eggs and Issues program featuring Congressman Stephen Horsford, and that's on Monday, September 22nd. At the Vidara Hotel, Congressman Horsford will highlight current federal legislation and provide updates from Capitol Hill. Please reserve your tickets today. And now for the main event. You know, um, our speaker today is a man who served in many roles to help make the state of Nevada a better place to live, work, and do business. After being sworn in to the United States Senate, Senator Dean Heller started serving on a variety of committees, including the Banking Committee, the Housing and Urban Affairs Committee, the Committee on Veterans Affairs, the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, the Commerce Committee, the Science and Transportation Committee, and the Special Committee on the Aging. These committees provided him with a variety of opportunities to address his top priorities, creating jobs, restoring Nevada's economy, keeping families in their homes, and ensuring our veterans receive the benefits they so dearly deserve. Always keeping Nevada on the forefront of his decisions, Senator Heller consistently votes on initiatives that positively contribute to enhancing tourism, creating a positive job sector, and providing for our economy. Time and time again, he has proven his commitment to the improvement of our community and the development of our local businesses. We at the Metro Chamber of Commerce are grateful for Senator Heller's commitment to our organization and all of our members. Ladies and gentlemen, United States Senator Dean Heller. Well, what a pleasure it is to be here and spend a few minutes with you. And as I like to say, it's uh, great to be out of Washington, D.C. and back in America. Uh, we do spend uh, our time together. We're here in August. I, I, you know, I sometimes feel that we are a little bit busier um, in August, uh, uh, bounce around the state, but I don't care as long as I'm home, as long as I'm home. And uh, if I may uh, wish uh, Mayor Lee a happy birthday. Uh, my wife just celebrated her 29th also. Uh, so congratulations. And I'll talk a little bit more about that birthday in a little bit, but uh, I want to thank you for the introduction. I want to thank the boss for allowing me to sit at the table with her and uh, everybody at our table for, uh, for, for a wonderful lunch. I do want to uh, talk about the, uh, the, uh, the elephant in the room, and uh, it's not John Ralston um, anymore, but it's this beard that I'm wearing. Yeah, as most of, uh, some of you may know, I uh, challenged uh, Senator Reid also to grow a beard. 
uh, for the uh, sesquicentennial, 150 years, October 31st. Uh, most of you are engaged in that uh, and uh, certainly looking forward to, uh, to doing that. Um, and here's the reason why. I've got a picture of myself uh, in 1964 sitting on the uh, lawn of the state capitol in Carson City with my brothers and sisters, mother and father, and my father has a beard. And I was looking at that picture recently and I said, Dad, I, I didn't know you had a beard. And he said, I never had a beard except in 1964, and the only reason I grew it was for the, for the centennial celebration. So in light of my father, um, who's now 81 this year, um, who had, at 31, a beard, I said I'd grow a sesquicentennial beard uh, for that same purpose and having some fun at it. I'll tell you how much fun I am having, besides the fact that I can't get Senator Reid to grow one, was the fact that I was in Las Vegas yesterday, uh, talking to more Californians, let's put it that way, than I was uh, 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 Nevadans. And I told them there's two reasons why Nevadans have more beards than Californians. First reason was, we can. <laughs> and the second reason was, Nevada doesn't tax facial hair. <laughs> I don't think Feinstein thought that was very funny. Needless to say, needless to say, having a lot of fun with this. Again, I want to thank everybody for being in attendance. Um, I uh, consider it an honor, a pleasure to serve you. I'm your guy in Washington, D.C., and I fight those battles for you. I'll continue to do so, and I want to thank each and every one of you for your help, your support um, in uh, phone calls, uh, letters, faxes, emails, text messages, you name it, uh, for your continued support as we move forward. I'd like to... Uh, Talk to you a little bit about my philosophy, about what I think is important, what I think is important back in Washington, D.C., and what you can count on me uh, when I am back in Washington, D.C. I think there's three areas. Before we get to question and answers, I want to talk about three areas that I think is important. Responsibilities of the federal government. Because questions are always asked. What's the state responsibility? What's the local government responsibility? What's the federal responsibility? Let me tell you what I think are the most important responsibilities of the federal government. And first and foremost is defense of this country. Defense of this country. There's nowhere else that you're going to go. You're not going to find a private company that's going to go out there and defend this country. And I think that is a, the, the number one purpose of the federal government, is to defend against the bad guys, both domestically um, and foreign. And you don't have to go much further than the front page of the USA Today and look at the articles in that paper, and if there's any doubt, if there's any doubt, Rome is burning. If you look at the conflicts that we have around this world today, you can go to Syria, Israel, um, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Russia, uh, Crimea, Ukraine, everywhere you look today, we're having some serious problems. And I'm concerned. I'm concerned. And I probably share that concern with most of you here in this room that this president isn't engaged. He's not engaged. He came and did a, uh, he did a, a, a news conference today from Martha's Vineyard. Um, I listened to it today talking about uh, Jim Foley, uh, the uh, journalist we lost, I was glad he did a news conference, but I sat there and as I listened to him, I wanted to know, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? And as he talked, I wanted to know, what are you going to do about it? And he finished his uh, news conference, walked away, and never answered that question. And I think those are questions that the American people want to know. What are we going to do about Israel? What are we going to do about Ukraine? What are we going to do about Iraq? What are we going to do about ISIS? What are we going to do in Israel? What is the answer to these questions? And I'll be the first to tell you, if he comes up with a good idea, I'll support him. I will support this president, but I want to hear the ideas first. Defense. Defense is the number one responsibility. We uh, worked uh, on some legislation. And there is good news back in Washington, D.C. Myself and Chuck Schumer introduced legislation uh, de dealing with terrorism risk. TRIA, many of you in this room have called and contacted my office. I know the chamber supported the TRIA bill that assesses, it's a backstop, a federal backstop against another terrorist attack. This uh, particular legislation came about in, in, after 9-11. Uh, 
to build a large uh, uh, facility like we see on the Strip. You can't get the necessary terrorism insurance without some kind of backing from the federal government. Uh, Schumer and I worked together. We had unanimous support in the banking committee. Unanimous. I don't know the last time the banking committee, with all of us on there, that we actually came together on one issue. But the impact of that TRIA bill, which, by the way, expires at the end of the year, passed the Senate unanimously, passed uh, um, the, uh, the United States Senate. I think the vote was 97 to 3. We actually brought Republicans and Democrats together. Chuck Schumer and I brought Republicans and Democrats together on an issue, an issue that's critically important. And why did I get involved in this? Because of the impact it would have on a state like Nevada, a city like Las Vegas. And I told my colleagues in Washington, this is not an East Coast issue. This isn't just about New York City. This isn't just about Chicago. This isn't just about Miami. But on the West Coast, cities like Las Vegas, you can imagine the impact that it would have on tourism and the economy in the state of Nevada if we were to have some major incident to occur. Los Angeles, San Francisco, anything that occurred in those communities obviously would have impact the state of Nevada also. So we pushed TRIA. The House of Representatives has not passed this. <clears throat> Excuse me. House of Representatives has not passed this uh, legislation yet. They have several ideas. We have till the end of the year to get this done. So we'll, uh, the job's not over is the, is the point. Job's not over and we'll get it done. Second thing, so we talk a little bit about defense and the importance federal government with the defense. The second is commerce. And I think everybody here in this room understands the importance of commerce. And when I talk commerce, uh, I'm talking infrastructure. The importance of infrastructure across this, this, this country, across the state of Nevada. Let me, let me share a, a quick story with you. I was up in Carson City. There's a company in Carson City that makes Fig Newtons. Believe it or not, I saw a Fig Newton that was the length of this room. One Fig Newton. I've never seen a Fig Newton that long. Obviously, that was before they cut it up. But they told me, they told me that they sell more of their Fig Newtons in the Northeast not in the West, not in the South, not in the Northwest. They sell more Fig Newtons in, in uh, New Hampshire, in Maine, uh, in Massachusetts than anywhere else in the country. And it's just a reminder of how important our infrastructure here is here um, in, this, uh, in this country. We passed a highway bill, kind of a makeshift uh, Band-Aid approach uh, just before we left, which is a good thing, um, but the, the authorization only goes through the month of May. Uh, what we need is an authorization of a highway bill that probably five or six years so that there's some consistency with those who build roads, those who do build bridges, the ability to build that freeway between uh, Phoenix and, and, and Las Vegas. I want to see that built. Everybody in our delegation is on board with that. Everybody in the Phoenix delegation is on board with that. Uh, we have the two largest communities uh, in the country that does not have a, a freeway uh, between the two of them, and that needs to be fixed. And that's going to happen, and it's well on its way. Now, where it goes in Las Vegas, I'll let the local governments decide where they, they, they want that freeway. But what I would like to see is that once that uh, freeway is built between Phoenix and Las Vegas, I want it to continue north. In other words, we have a freeway that cuts uh, uh, Nevada uh, east and west. I'd like to see a freeway that cuts Nevada north and south. And I think getting that kind of commerce in the state of Nevada is, is, is overdue. As again, I, I just want to express my commitment to you that uh, I support. I do support a five to six year solution, five to six year solution uh, on, a, on, a, on a highway bill, but it's going to take revenue to do it. And that's the, the big issue. A uh, highway bill that's uh, five or six years, uh, this, this uh, six month extension costs $10 million. So it's $10 billion. So it gives you some idea how expensive a five to six. Uh, year extension would be on a highway bill, and obviously re revenue is, is the biggest issue there. Third thing that I want to talk about before I finish, and that is, uh, uh, that's the safety net. I believe uh, uh, defense, commerce, and a safety net, three, three primary functions of your federal government. And you've seen me way out in front on this. For some, too, com too or uncomfortable that I'm this far out in front on this safety net. Nevada's been hit hard by this recession after the last four or five years, hit real hard. Um, there are some good Nevadans that are looking for work. And if you're looking for work, 
uh, you shouldn't lose your house in that process. And that's my goal. And that's what this unemployment extension is all about. And to, to make sure that Nevadans that are looking for work, looking for work, have an opportunity um, to, uh, to keep their homes and to, uh, to, to, to keep everybody safe and sound uh, within that home. So I'm going to continue to push on unemployment insurance. Uh, as long as we have such high uh, unemployment as we have here in the state of Nevada, uh, those that are um, uh, struggling, those that are working hard, I think that safety net is criti critically important. And I will say this, I don't think it should be a lifestyle. This safety net, unemployment insurance, shouldn't be a lifestyle, but it should be for their, those who need it most. And I hear stories, and, uh, and, and you could probably tell me stories, about individuals that abuse that system. And I believe you. I believe you. But for every story, I'd like you to spend some time in my office back in Washington, D.C., and get the other stories. Because there is another side of that story. For every story you have, I probably have 500 on the other side that really need the help and the support just to get them back on their feet, get them back in the workforce, and, and let's move this economy forward. So there's, there's where I stand. I said that two years ago when I ran for this office, and I'm still there today. You will find me on defense efforts. You'll find me supporting the Department of Defense. You'll find me supporting the VA. Um, and, and with this new secretary that's come in, and maybe we can talk about that through one of the questions. We got Secretary McDonald came in, helping these veterans, 300,000 in Nevada, and more coming back, needs all the support and help that we as uh, legislators can give them. Um, so this safety net, this commerce, those are the issues you're going to see me voting on and pushing the hardest when I'm back in Washington, D.C. I want to just thank all of you again for allowing me to be here, and I want to tell one story real quick. I told you things are tough. Things are really tough. Uh, as I said, Rome's burning. Look at the papers. Look at all the problems that we have domestically um, and internationally. Look at the economy for the last five years and how rough that's been and how tough it's been on states like Nevada, Rhode Island. Jack Reed and I have worked closely together because Rhode Island and Nevada are probably the two hardest hits. But I want to share a quick story with you, and uh, it goes back to my, uh, my, my wife's birthday. Uh, not birthday, I'm sorry, anniversary. Let me get that straight. My wife and I last month celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary. Now, we were pretty happy about that. 30 is pretty important. I think every woman here in this room probably agrees that 30 years is a, an important um, uh, stepping stone as, as, uh, as you move forward. So I told her, I said, what do you want to do? Just tell me what you want to do for our 30th wedding anniversary. And I, I, I opened it up. Um, some would choose to go to New York and go see some shows. And frankly, I thought that's what my wife was going to pick. She loves to sing and dance and all that. Uh, so I thought she'd pick uh, New York. Um, I wouldn't have been surprised had it been Hawaii. But she made her choice. And this is how good of a wife she is. She says, this is what I want to do. I want to pack our horses, and I want to go up to Lake Tahoe. And I want to spend three or four days up there. Just you and me, alone, with, with nobody around. So we did that. Packed our horses. Overpacked our horses, let me put it that way. One horse is very upset with me right now. 180 pounds. There's a lot of weight on the back of a horse, especially dead weight. Um, but we went up there for three or four days. And outside, outside of a few feisty bears, when you cook fish outdoors up at Lake Tahoe, you do have interesting visitors that come. And we had a couple of black bears decide they wanted to come visit us. And, and uh, fortunately, our dogs were with us. Everything was fine. It was actually quite interesting. But this is what I wanted to point out. And that is, uh, uh, Laxalt has a piece of property up near a lake called Marlette. It's a reservoir. The Laxalt uh, property was where Paul Laxalt and Ronald Reagan used to come together and uh, work together on issues uh, relating to both Nevada and California. The Tahoe Regional Planning Agency was, uh, the birth of that was at, uh, up at Lake Tahoe. But what was interesting, what was interesting, there's an old picnic table that was actually built out of some old trees up there, so it's, it, it's in pretty bad shape, uh, this particular table. But one of the things that's really neat, there's a, there's a, there's a piece of plastic um, on this table, and in it is carved Ronald Reagan's signature. And if you stop and think about some of the decisions that were made on that piece of property, and to see Ronald Reagan's signature, and my reflection is this. It doesn't have to be as bad as it is today. Ronald Reagan came in in 1980. 
and the economy was in tough shape. We were in the middle of the Cold War. Um, we had terrorist strikes. They were holding for ransom uh, some United States citizens. Things were tough. And we got the right person in for leadership. All I'm telling you this, it's not inevitable. This isn't inevitable. What we're seeing outside the country, things that we're seeing inside the country, this isn't inevitable. Things can change. And things can change for the better. What we need is new leadership. We need new leadership. We need good leadership in Washington, D.C. And you do that. You do that, and you can change the world. You can change your country, and you can change your hometown of Las Vegas. So I just want to end on a high note. It can be better. It will be better. We'll find the right people to do it. Someone said 76 days. 76 days. That's the number. 76 days is the opportunity and chance, uh, chance for America to make the kind of changes that we need. So let's see what happens. After that, the next most important number is 51, by the way. Uh, someone pointed that out to me, and that's 51 senators. And, uh, but I certainly don't want to play down the number three either. Number three is pretty important also. Let's vote no on three. Thank you very much for having me here and taking time with you. So the first very question good. that came in was on health care. And one of our members writes, as a small business owner, I am concerned about the impacts of the health insurance tax, which disproportionately impacts the small business community. Can you please tell me what your thoughts are on the tax and how we can help to understand what you are doing to help mitigate the impacts or prevent the implementation. Okay, this goes back to uh, 76 days, and maybe we can get some changes in this health care law. There's some good things in that health care law. Um, obviously, overall, I, I, I didn't support it. Uh, I think there was much more bad in this bill than there was good, and for that reason, I didn't support it. Let's put this in perspective. The reason um, that the Affordable Care Act was put into place is because we had 30 million Americans that did not have health insurance. I think everybody here in this room will agree to that. 30 million Americans that didn't have health insurance, about 10% of our population. So we passed the Affordable Care Act. Um, today, 7 million more people have health insurance. 7 million. Now, if you stop and think about it, five of them were people like myself who lost the insurance they were on and had to go to the Affordable Care Act. So with all of this that we're seeing, we have increased two million people that otherwise would not have had health care ins uh, insurance. What could we have done differently? And I think that's the question everybody here in this room is asking. What could we have done differently? And I think to pick up two million more, and by the way, government says that's a success. We needed 30, we got two, we're winning. And I disagree with that. I disagree with that. What could we have done differently? If you wanted to pick up two million more, you could have expanded Medicaid. You could have expanded Medicaid, and the owner, all these regulations and all the impact that it would have had on small businesses. You know, 99% of the employers in the state of Nevada are small businesses. You employ about 40% of the, uh, the uh, population here uh, and, and throughout the state. And the impact that this bill has and the disincentives that, there, that are in that bill uh, are just incredible. What I'm hoping is that we'll see some real changes. And we'll sit, if Republicans take control of the Senate, I think we're going to put some things on the, on the president's desk. I do anticipate that he'll veto them. He will veto any changes that he sees in the Affordable Care, but I think he will finally see some changes. Medical device tax, 30-hour um, uh, work week expanded to 40-hour work week. We're going to see some changes, and we're going to put them on the president's desk, and you know what? He's going to veto them. But you know we're going to put them on the desk again, and he's going to veto it a second time. And you know what? We're going to put it on his desk again. And maybe the third time he signs it. See, this is exactly what happened under President Clinton on, in welfare reform. Republicans put welfare reform on his desk, and... He vetoed it, and they did it twice, and he vetoed it a third time. He finally signed it. So I'm hoping that uh, with some changes uh, in, in Washington, D.C., we'll be able to uh, put some things on the president's desks that, uh, that ultimately he'll support. Thank you. On the uh, subject of tourism, we had a, which of course is critical for us, uh, one of the questions that came in was, I would like to thank you for your leadership in your co-sponsoring of the Reauthorization of Terrorism Risk Insurance Act in the U.S. Senate. As you know, this bill is extremely important to Nevada, Nevada's tourism industry and hospitality industry. What do you think is the likelihood of the, that the House will take action on this before the current legislation expires? 
I don't think it's going to pass in September. We only have two and a half weeks in September before we hit up against a, a pretty hard-fought election coming in November. So it'll have to be done during the lame duck session. Our, our, the variable out there is Jeb Hinserling, who's uh, chairman of the Financial Services Committee, and I've had a couple of conversations with him. Um, Jeb has some different ideas. He certainly wants to water it down, uh, but I think at the end of the day, during the lame duck session, you're going to see TRIA pass. We have to pass TRIA. This isn't you know, just about New York or Chicago or Miami or uh, Philadelphia. This is about the West Coast, Las Vegas, uh, uh, Los Angeles, uh, as I said in my remarks, San Francisco. So this is very, very important piece of legislation. I know it's not sexy. This isn't something you run around the state of Nevada talking about TRIA, you know, because it's, uh, so, it's, it, it's kind of an in the woods, uh, uh, a deep issue that, that the chamber truly understands, um, but it's hard to, to get the average uh, person out there to really understand what Terrorist Risk Insurance Act is all about. But it's great to be able to be in front of a group and a crowd like this that understands and, and the, these risks and the fact that there isn't a private insurer out there that can, uh, that can determine that risk. So without this backstop of the federal government, um, these large venues that we have here in the state of Nevada will, will cease to be built. Thank you. On, uh, on the lands bill, we wanted to know, can you share with us any updates that you may have uh, about some of the lands bill and the impact on Nevada, such as the Thule Springs National Monument and the Northern Nevada Land Conservation the, and the Economic Development Act? Okay. There's a number of pieces of lands bills that, uh, uh, that are floating around Washington, D.C. right now. And our congressional delegation is actually doing a very good job. Um, and, uh, and I don't believe, in fact, uh, Harry, uh, Senator Reid and I were on a television show uh, uh, in the last couple of days. In fact, I think the second portion of it aired today, talking about these very, very, these very issues on these lands bills and that the Senate isn't the problem of moving these things forward. Here's the problem in Washington, D.C. You've got to have enough lands bills to actually have one omnibus omnibus bill that you can pass through. Nothing goes through on its own. Very, very difficult to get a, a single piece of legislation passed. So we're gathering all this, uh, these lands bills across the country. And uh, a number of them, obviously, from Nevada, but uh, Utah, uh, West Coast, and, and, and these states that uh, federal government, frankly, owns too much of the land um, are the ones that are impacted most with this lands bill. We're going to see something done. I, I, I believe there's a 70% chance to see this legislation pushed before the end of the year. Again, probably done during the lame, lame duck session, um, but I give it a, 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 I'm very aggressive and very optimistic uh, that it'll get done. Great. You know, here in the Southwest, obviously, immigration reform is a huge issue. What do you think Congress will do in regards to immigration reform? The Senate passed a comprehensive bill earlier this session, but the House has not taken any action. Yet, what options are available to Congress and to the President? Well, I wish I had a, a, an easy answer to that. And I was one of uh, 16 Republicans that supported the comprehensive immigration reform legislation um, and would love to see the House take it up. Uh, both Senator Reid and I mentioned this uh, on our television show that uh, we believe if, that, if the Senate version were to go to the House floor, that it would pass. I believe that today. Senator Reid believes that today. I'd like to see that happen. The problem is, is whether or not we'll get leadership to put that piece of legislation down on the floor. Here, here's the problem with comprehension. Um, Republicans have a tendency not to do anything comprehensive. Republicans want to do it piece by piece by piece. That's why you don't see comprehensive tax reform. And I think a lot of us would like to see comprehensive tax reform. There's a lot of changes in our tax structure that we could, that we could do. It's just that for Republicans, for conservatives, even the moderates, you take a look at comprehensive, it's too much at once. So rarely do you see comprehensive measures pass, um, in the, or you wouldn't see it in the House of Representatives. It's very, very difficult to pass anything comprehensive. You notice that comprehensive uh, health care reform occurred when both houses were, uh, were controlled by the Democrats. Never would have occurred. What we want to do is take it a little step, a step at a time. And I think that's where the House is today. I cannot imagine uh, leadership bringing that to the floor, but I can imagine them taking pieces of it and breaking it into five or six different pieces, bringing it down to the floor, and trying to move legislation that way. I don't choose that way. Um, I would love to see the Senate bill come to the floor because we need to get something done because we have some real issues with 11 or 12 million people that are here uh, and undocumented and they need a pathway, some support, so that we can help all businesses um, from agriculture all the way to high tech in getting this work done. So 
I, I think they're going to piecemeal it. I would love to encourage the speaker, love to encourage the majority leader to bring this bill down to the floor. I just don't see it happening. You know, we've got so many issues uh, that are pending, and, and I've only got time for one more question, so I'm going to ask it. If you had a magic wand, which, which legislation would you pass first? What do you think the most important thing is on your agenda? Boy, you know, I, I, I talked a little bit about my priorities, um, defense. Um, I would love to see a, a defense bill passed, a strong defense bill. We're weakening our national defense here in this country. We're sending the wrong message. We're not threatening ISIS. ISIS is threatening us today. It is the wrong message that we have. And I think that is the number one job, number one responsibility. There's a lot of things I could pick based on what you said, but the number one responsibility of this federal government is to defend each and every one of us. And I think the most important bill every year that comes out of Washington, D.C. is that Department of Defense bill and how we treat these veterans when they come back um, into uh, uh, back into the country, these men and women that have served this country. Uh, I don't think there's anything that is above that, uh, that legislation every year. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you again. You know, we have a, actually, we have one more uh, special presentation. So I need to invite Dick Kastner, who is the Western Regional Director of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to the stage. Um, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is the world's largest business federation. We represent more than three million businesses of all sizes, all types, from all parts of the country. And by represent, we mean in Washington, D.C., we do our damnedest to get the best possible deal we can for the business community. We work hard, most hard, with the Congress. Uh, we do what we can with the administration to try to get, see to it that businesses' voice is heard. With this administration, that's occasionally been difficult. So we go to the courts and sue the bastards. <laughs> now, With the Congress, where we spend most of our time, we found keeping voting records is a very helpful thing. And we do that, and every year we publish how they voted, uh, which tracks um, floor votes on the House and the Senate of the U.S. Congress. And, um, uh, and, and that's a very useful thing to know. Um, it's very interesting, but it's, but it's not quite enough for the members of Congress that stand with business when it isn't particularly popular, who are there for jobs, for economic growth, um, it, it, it isn't always the popular, the soundbite position. But they cast that tough vote anyway. For them, we wanted to do something more. So, uh, so for those members of Congress that vote with the business community 70 or more percent of the time over an entire session of Congress, a full year, we have this, the Spirit of Enterprise Award. And uh, you see where this is all headed. It says Senator Dean Heller on the bottom. Um, last year, on the issues that mattered most to businesses of all sizes, all types, from all parts of the country, your Senator, Dean Heller, voted with business seven out of eight times for an 88% voting record. Dean just asked the question that's on all of your minds. What was that eighth vote? <clears throat> A minor disagreement among good friends. Let's not talk about it here. <laughs> Let's focus on the other seven, okay? If every state had senators like you do here with Dean Heller, we'd have a hell of a lot fewer problems than we do now. Um, Dean, you clearly deserve this award. It is my very sincere privilege to be able to present it. Thank you very much. <laughs> you You know, no matter, no matter what party you're in, you have to respect the fact that uh, the senator's in the arena, and that's a tough place to be. So we all appreciate the service. And of course, we all appreciate the sponsors. And uh, I'm going to go through the list one more time so we can thank them one more time. Chamber, benefits ins Chamber Insurance Benefits. <laughs> 
Sunrise Health System, and the Las Vegas Review Journal. Thank you all for coming. Have a great week. Drive safely.